Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today's episode is going to be an extra long one full of horrifying stories from the great outdoors that'll freak you out tonight. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, and stories like yours help keep this show going on a daily basis. Be sure to smash that like button, subscribe if you're new, turn on that bell notification so you don't miss new episodes as I upload them multiple times a week, and get ready for these creepy and downright strange horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is there to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like delivered right to your door. Don't let recipe boredom strike because HelloFresh has more options than ever before. Dig into their biggest menu yet with over 45 dinner options to choose from weekly, and even more market add-on items that suit any lifestyle. So, what are you waiting for? Join me and many others in the swamp today. Go to hellofresh.com slash swamped free and use code swamped free, all one word, for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash swamped free with code FREES. Come find out why me and many others in the swamp today are using HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. This is a pretty short story, but it was a pretty scary experience for me. One day back in late 2018, my sister and mom decided to go to the mall. This mall is located in Lexington, Kentucky about an hour away, and is always crowded. Not to mention that traffic is always horrible. After arriving, my little sister went off with her friends and my mom went to the Apple store to get her phone fixed. I quickly grew bored after about 10 minutes since I'm a pretty impatient person, so I told my mom I was going to go look in Forever 21. On my way out, I noticed a man staring me down pretty intensely. I thought it was creepy, but I decided to ignore it, until he followed me. I quickly got nervous at this point. He held a phone up to his ear, but he wasn't speaking. He followed me until I went into Forever 21. I waited there for about 15 minutes or so to be safe. I couldn't find anything I liked, so I decided to leave. To my surprise, the man was waiting outside the store and quickly followed me. I was growing more scared by the minute so I hid in the crowd. He lost me for about a few moments, but somehow noticed me and followed me again, all the way back to the Apple store. I didn't tell my mom what was going on, but I felt safer being around her. The man just stood outside the store staring me down, with the most intense look I could... I just can't think I can ever forget that look. It was just so... intense and... fixated, I I can't even explain. I believe he gave up and left eventually when I left the store with my mom. I later realized that pretending to be on the phone is a tactic that most of these people use. A lot of girls are being kidnapped around my state recently, even in grocery store parking lots. People speculate that they're taking these girls and forcing them into sex rings. The scariest thing is, is that one of those girls could have been me. This may not be scary to others, but... I know, the experience for me was terrifying. I plan on investing in some pepper spray, so I can at least defend myself somewhat. I'll always be more careful from now on because of that experience. This is something that happened to me about a month ago. My dog Leo was running low on dry food and I had just gotten home from work. I was exhausted. And the last thing I wanted to do was leave the comfort of my couch after a long day and make a trip to the grocery store. But I couldn't let my dog go hungry, so I got up, I put Leo in his cage, I got in my car, 
and I went to the store. While driving, I got a few messages from people, so I parked the car a little further away from the other cars in the parking lot. By the time I got to the store, it was about 11pm, and I think the store was about to close soon, so I needed to hurry, but I was just so tired. I just sat in my car, responding to text messages, I watched a couple of YouTube videos on my phone, just trying to wait for a moment I could force myself to get up and go inside just to do what I came to do, just before I got out of my car. I looked up, and there was a man standing about 50 feet away, just standing, facing towards me. Was he, was he staring at me? What was he doing? I sat in my car and just waited to see what happened next. I had this nagging feeling that this was someone I didn't want to talk to. Something was off. Not only did I have a bad feeling, it was getting worse as he began to slowly walk towards me. I lowered my head, made sure that the doors were locked and acted like I didn't notice him. Maybe he'd just go away. But no. He walked right up to my side of the car and stopped right outside the window. I want to talk to you. Don't move. Don't look at him. Just look at your phone. Act preoccupied. Hey. Something you need to understand about me. I'm genuinely a friendly person who loves people. I love to talk to them. I'm actually a very extroverted and eager to meet new people kind of guy. I have no problem talking to strangers. I've even had a few moments in my life where people came up to me in a similarly strange way. So why was my adrenaline and fear so high right now? If there's one thing people know about people that live in Texas, it's that there's a good chance most people you meet carry a weapon of some kind. But I didn't. I grew up in the North, and I hadn't been exposed to firearms. It's just one of those things that it's been on my mind to get, but I've never really bothered to invest in getting a pistol or anything. I tried keeping an eye on this man in my peripheral view, being careful not to make any eye contact or give him any reason to confirm that I knew that he was there. He stood there for a moment. I thought I saw him make a motion towards the handle on my door, but I I, I can't tell. After a few moments, he slowly kept walking the direction that he had already been walking before. I took a deep breath. I waited about ten more minutes before I decided to look around to see if the coast was clear. Was he gone? It looked like it. I made one more visual sweep before I opened the door. Time to get that dog food and get the hell out of here. As soon as I closed the door to my car, a gold Saturn came zooming up to me and stopped right at my car. It was the same guy. Hey, I want to ask you something about your car. My car? My car is nothing special, let me tell you. At this point, I was feeling a combination of fear and anger. Dude, if I wanted to talk to you, I would have responded. Now get the hell out of here! He started to get agitated and started calling me a dick and told me that I was being an asshole. But I was having none of that. If somebody wants to be left alone, leave them the hell alone. He started to drive off, his belts and brakes squeaking in his rickety old gold Saturn as it started to zoom off. Girl that was collecting the shopping carts came up to me as I was trying to walk into the store and she came up to me and said that she witnessed the whole thing and wanted to know if I was okay. I told her everything that happened and as I'm speaking to her, he drives right up to me again. Hey asshole, I just wanted to ask you a question. Get the fuck out of here, dude. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Now face forward, drive away, and move on. He called me a prick and drove off. I didn't go inside. I watched him as he drove to the other end of the lot and started slowly circling around the lot. Now I couldn't go inside because I wasn't sure what he was going to do to my car. Finally, he disappeared. I didn't see where he went, but I didn't see him anymore. I asked the girl to keep an eye on things, especially my car, and I just went inside. I just I needed to get that dog food, so I got it. 
I texted my brothers and a few other friends to let them know what had just happened just in case something unexpected came next. I paid for the dog food and walked back outside. He was there waiting for me. Hey. He began to say, Get the f- out of here! I swear to God I'm going to call the cops if you don't leave me f- alone! I yelled. His face was twisted with fury and anger. Why was he still coming after me? And why was he particularly so unsettling to me? Didn't matter. Something about him was way off, and I wanted no part of any of it. As he sped off, I kicked myself for not getting his license plate. Was he actually going to leave? I saw him exit the parking lot, turn right, and drive away down the main road. Was he really gone? I waited a moment, and I talked to the girl that was collecting the shopping carts who saw everything as well. She hadn't gotten the plate number either. After about 15 minutes, I felt convinced enough that he was gone, and felt like it might be safe to start driving home. Fortunately, there's a gate to my neighborhood with a guard, so he wouldn't have been able to follow me into the neighborhood if he decided to follow me home. I got in my car, and I started to drive home. I was checking my surroundings every few seconds, checking my rearview mirror. A car started closing its distance between us. I froze. Then it turned on its blinker, passed me, and drove off. It wasn't him. I finally made it home. Leo got his food. I got home safely. I don't really know how much danger I was in, if any. And looking back, I still can't really put my finger on what bothered me so much about that guy. But at this point, it is what it is. Whenever I go to that store, I'm always on the lookout, though, for a gold Saturn. This past summer, I got a job at one of the grocery stores in my area. We have three to four places to buy groceries from in my town. And this story takes place about a month and a half after I was first hired. I was what is known as a service clerk. Thankfully, I'm now a cashier. Which essentially means you do janitorial jobs during the day, such as changing trash bags or cleaning bathrooms. I was assigned to go change the trash bags throughout the store. So I began doing my work. And finally got to one of the two entrances we have with trash cans. We frequently have employees standing at either entrance asking for donations for local charities that our store supports. So there was one of the people from customer service there, who we will call Jess. As I began changing the trash at the entrance, Jess and I were chatting, and a woman came up to us. Usually this will mean a customer has a question about stock or something like that, and if you've ever worked in a large store such as this, you'll know that feeling of not knowing about your stock is more terrifying than any of these stories. However, she did not have any questions about what we had in stock that day. She told Jess and me that there is a man outside the store. Our store is right next to another large store, which will also go nameless, who was sitting on a small step. Our doors to the inside and outside of the store are clear glass so we both were able to get a good look at him as the woman was talking. He was an African-American male, with a beard, and although it was the middle of July, he was wearing a hoodie, a beanie, and black jeans and large boots. The man was relatively large, but it was hard to gauge his size because of the fact that he was sitting on such a low step. I would put him at around 6'3", though, and probably over 300 pounds and a heavy build. I assumed he was waiting for a ride, but she began to say she knew the man. The woman said she had seen the man a few times in her area. She lived in a local apartment complex, so this is not necessarily uncommon, being a shared living space. He would apparently sometimes sleep in the gazebo located in the park adjacent to the apartments. I finished changing the trash, and we also kept a large trash can right outside, which I would also have to change meaning I would have to get up close to the man to do my job. Where he was sitting was maybe 15 feet away from the trash can, 
so he could definitely see me. Jess and the woman kept talking, and I said I would go out and change the trash and see if the man did anything strange. I changed the trash and heard him talking. He had wired earbuds connected to what looked like a phone, so I assumed he was on the call. I went back inside with my wheeled trash can that had the bags I changed inside and told the woman and Jess that the man was probably on the phone because he had earbuds in, but the woman was still anxious about him being here and told us another story that freaked Jess and me out. This woman had a tomato patch in her backyard and planted them every summer with success. The tomatoes grew and she expected to use them in her cooking over the summer, but she was horrified when she says the almost ripe tomatoes were gone from her patch. Some still remain, but many were completely gone. She figured it was an animal, so she stayed up the next few nights to watch the tomato patch to see if anything was taking her tomatoes. She waited in her bedroom and was shocked to see the man running into her garden, taking more tomatoes, and running out. She apparently was too afraid to pursue him but was extremely scared. Another family in the complex had complained that the man would sometimes sit around at the playground in the area, and obviously, their kids could not play while this man was around. Apparently, he had never said anything to anyone, but would just sit there while talking. After hearing these stories, Jess and I looked to each other with raised eyebrows, and, at least for me, genuine anxiety about this man. The woman had the idea to take a picture of him with her phone, which scared me because if he saw her, I had no idea how he would react. After some talking, I agreed to go outside with the woman and pretend to change the trash again, as she took a photo. I am somewhat lean and lanky build at 6'2", so I tried to hide her behind me since she was very short. She was older and clearly was not too familiar with her phone, and did not even attempt to make it look like she was just using her phone as she clearly pointed it at the man with two hands and took the pictures. She quickly went back inside and Jess took her to customer service to see if they could do anything, and I waited outside to make sure the man did not try anything on Kenny customers or anything like that. I also made sure he didn't even try to begin to enter the store. Legally, of course, he is allowed inside, but I wanted to make sure if he did, I would know. I heard him talking but realized his earbuds were no longer plugged into his phone. As I said, it was the afternoon in the summer at a grocery store on a weekend, so there is a lot of noise and business, so there's no way that he would have been able to have a speakerphone conversation from that distance. He was also looking straight ahead to the parking lot and almost looked stuck as if he was focusing on something, but it was just a lot. This freaked me out and my heart sank when he looked at me. I was still pretending to change the trash, but I felt his gaze on me and saw his head turn in my peripheral vision. I heard him talking and he began to get a little louder. At this point, he was definitely talking to himself. I heard him saying, You can't play me. Knock his ass out if you try some shit like that again. You try to play me? You get rocked, you feel me? And he just kept repeating, Can't do that. A few times. I don't think he was referring to me. As when I moved to go inside, he was still looking at the trash can. I waited inside and the man kept staring at the trash can. I went back inside to check on woman and Jess, and they were at the customer service. I still had to do my job and I was anxious that I would get in trouble if I did not get it done soon, since I was just tired, and I was trying really hard not to mess up and get fired or have any supervisors hate me. I left and changed the other trash in the store. Later in the day, I asked Jess about the situation, and evidently they did not call the police, probably because he was not doing anything that was actually illegal. When I checked if he was still there, he had left. I have not seen him again, and I hope he has gotten his life together, or has at least stopped scaring the residents in that apartment complex. This happened about a year and a half ago when I and my family had just moved here from very peaceful and a very rural hometown. I was finishing my day at school late 6pm-ish, and the rain was pouring so I ran to the public bus station, which was four blocks away from my school. When I got there I was soaked, 
and there were no people around and there were no buses coming soon. I then got the great idea just to make signs at the next cab, so they would take me home. Something no one should do in this city, as it is highly recommended to call a cab service and never get one on the streets as it is very dangerous as they usually commit many crimes and the criminal is almost never caught. Every cab that passed was full until one stopped in front of me and I got on. From the moment I stepped foot in that cab, I had a terrible gut feeling, and when I looked at the driver, I felt even less unsafe. His eyes were red, and his grin, as I got in, gave me an overall bad feeling. I told him where I was going, without stating my full address, and he started driving, while stating that he loved colored women, and that I looked exotic, as he put it. This was all he said for almost the whole ride. For the next 20 minutes he stared at me in the mirror, and turned around to look at my body every two minutes or so. He didn't mind getting caught. I was obviously uncomfortable, but decided to ignore it because I really just wanted to go home and take a warm shower. Now, I get to my house from the street we are on. He had to turn right on X Street, but when he stopped in front of it at a red light, he turned around, looked at me, and made the most terrifying smile that still haunts me to this day, before going to the complete opposite direction of my house, and going much faster than was allowed. While he drove, he still had the smile and was looking at me more than the road. I started telling him that he was going the wrong way and to please slow down, and he just kept smiling and staring. I kept on trying to stay calm and convince him to let me out, as all the doors were locked. I started panicking more and more and raising my voice to the point of screaming at him as loudly as I could, as where we were entering was a very dangerous neighborhood. My parents had always warned me about it. I started crying as I screamed and he was seemingly getting stressed by me, so I kept going until he stopped the car, shouted at me, and grabbed my wrist to make me take a look at him. He told me to get the heck out of here and pay him an excessive amount of money, which I did because I was too scared to speak at that point. It was dark now and I was in a really bad neighborhood, so I started walking away really fast in the direction of my house, when I heard him scream at me, Wait! Come back here! And at that point my mind went blank, and the only thing I remember was running as fast as I could, and then crying at home in the shower. Since then, I refused to take street cabs, and always call taxis or use Uber. I still think often about what would have happened if I hadn't kept trying to stress him, or... I don't know. I, it just, I just get really scatterbrained trying to tell this story because of how terrifying it was. This happened a couple of years ago when I was living abroad. I had just got off the night shift and was waiting at the bus stop at around 6 a.m. It was just starting to get bright out and the area I worked in was the party city in this country, so it was pretty crowded with people just finishing their nights out. I noticed a girl who was pretty drunk sitting at the door of the shop beside the bus stop. Some guy was with her and his arm was around her shoulders, but I could tell something wasn't right. But to anyone passing by and not paying attention, they easily could pass as a couple. I tried to act casual and sat beside them and pretended to be looking at my phone while I tried to assess the situation. He nodded at me and tightened his grip on her and started to whisper in her ear. The girl looked really uncomfortable, but she was also too drunk to actually move away or say anything. She was heavily slurring her words. This went on for a couple of more minutes. He was whispering in her ear and constantly surveying the area, smiling to himself that nobody seemed to have noticed. I had about four minutes until the bus came, and the bad feeling in my stomach was growing worse, so I said screw it. I need to do something now. I leaned over to the girl and said, is this your boyfriend? The man stared me down and said yes, but I ignored his glare and asked the girl again. She started crying and shook her head no. I asked her if she knew him or ever met him. Again, she shook her head no. The man became visibly frustrated and insisted they knew each other. 
I asked the girl if she was going to my area. She nodded yes. I told her I would bring her there and lifted her up. At this point, the dude rolled his eyes and started cursing at me. I held his gaze but was terrified on the inside in case he got on the bus and followed us. Thankfully, when the bus pulled up, he just turned and walked away. I'm guessing this was because a few people were now waiting to get on, and he didn't want to cause a scene. I sat beside the girl on the bus, which was about a 20 minute ride. She was still quite drunk and slurring her words at this stage, but from what I could piece together, she had lost her friends and her phone died, and this man started talking to her when she left the club to find them. He kept insisting on bringing her to his house. When we got to our stop, I walked her to her home and made sure she got in okay. She asked me to take her number so she could talk to me when she was sober. We chatted a few times since that, but she said she was extremely thankful I had noticed something was up. When she left the club, she was stumbling and this guy apparently came out of nowhere and started offering to help her, putting his arm around her so she could walk, etc. He was telling her things like he was going to take her back to his house and have fun with her. She said she was terrified but too drunk to get the words to call out for help. When I had sat beside them, he was whispering in her ear to shut up and not say anything. It's also worth noting that this guy was 100% sober, and this wasn't just a drunk person trying to get an easy hookup. The place this happened in is a party city, as I said, so unfortunately it is likely that this kind of thing happens all the time and a lot of guys could be getting away with this type of behavior. If you are ever in a situation like this and you feel like you can help somebody in distress, please don't hesitate. If you don't feel comfortable approaching someone yourself, you could always call the cops as well. If you are a victim in this situation, do your best to call out to a passerby for help. Always be aware of your surroundings and be safe. Make sure your friends and family know exactly where you are and who you are with. Imagine 1984, Eastern Europe, Romania to be exact. I'm four years old and I'm on vacation with my grandparents to improve my health. I disappeared into thin air for five hours and, obviously, I reappeared. It's hard to be precise about this because I remember what happened so clearly. That after 34 years, I can't stop thinking about it. I'm trying to make sense of this, but so far, your guess is as good as mine. So, the 80s, Eastern Europe, to be precise, Romania, and the northern Carpathian Mountains. Early summer, I think it was May or June. As a kid, I was always sick, usually with some respiratory infections, so my grandparents thought it would be a good idea to take me to the mountains for my health. Back then, nobody had heard of allergies. My grandparents took me on vacation to a little mountain village and resort called Vatra Dornay. At the time, it was a sweet and cozy place in a woodsy elevated area. The hotel we stayed in was in the middle of a park, morphing into the woods around. I remember lots of squirrels lived in the park surrounding the hotel. The animals were used to people feeding them. It was a major attraction. You could buy walnuts in the hotel and bang them together, and the squirrels would come racing down the trees and snatch the nuts out of your palm or just eat them then and there. They weren't shy at all. The village was further down a slope and stretched along the main road in train tracks. There were several tiny shops, a restaurant, and a coffee slash pastry shop. The train station was tiny, but it was the heart of the village. The main road then split into a U-bent Y-shape over a narrow concrete bridge. The side road, ran with the broad creek on one side and a woodsy rocky slope on the other, with only one row of civilian houses. And that was it. That was the village, as far as I remember. The water in the creek was low and had a bluish-green look to it, and it was a hot and cloudless day, maybe a bit muggy. A fairly pleasant day. Birds chirped, the creek whispered, there was the warm, sweet-scented wind rustling through the lush of green trees. It was nearly noon when my grandparents and I were on our way into a boutique of sorts. For some unknown reason, I really don't know why I got so weirded out by that shop, I didn't want to go in. I told my grandparents that I didn't want to, but they tried to drag me along. I'm a dog now. Dogs aren't allowed inside. 
I grabbed a light pole in front of the shop and hooked my arms around it, like children tend to do. I was serious about it, and demonstrated with stubbornly clinging to it. Hiding my face from Grandma and Grandpa, I remember my grand losing it and just telling me, Fine, dogs stay where you leave them. I simply nodded. Happy to have gotten my will, honestly. I barked, panted, and looked around, scratched my ear with a pretended paw. Then it went fuzzy. Suddenly, I focused into conscious. I don't know how else to describe it. A slowly growing sense of recognition. Like waking up or wiping off your dirty glasses and suddenly seeing properly. Walking down the side of the road, the bridge now in my back, the river only to my right, the rocky slope to my left with the woods looming over the street, the shop was over 500 meters behind me. I was suddenly aware that there were no people. At all. It felt hollow, empty, this feeling of loneliness. I was truly alone. Then I noticed it was silent. There was no sound whatsoever. The river, the wind, the birds, all gone. The sound, just quiet. I couldn't even hear myself. I walked into absolute silence. I suspected that all the movement around me had stopped. My mind was working miraculously, effortlessly, and crystal clear. Even at that age, I marveled at that. Since then, I have never reached that level of clearness and concentrated logic. And that is a remarkable thing. I made several paces on the pavement, and I looked at my feet. I noted that I was throwing out six long shadows in every direction. I was the center of a shadow star. I asked myself where the light was coming from. So many shadows weren't normal. I knew that. I tilted my head to look up. In the sky, there was no sun, no moon, no light source whatsoever. It was strangely dim in a murky twilight. I was in a most remarkable place. I dubbed the place behind the curtains or hallway to reality. Right as I started to fully realize the strangeness of the situation, I focused again on holding the pole. I felt dazed. For me, this situation took only five minutes. My grandpa frantically grabbed me by the shoulders asking me where I had been. Why did I wander off? Confused, I told him I was right here. I was a doggy. I waited for you to come out again. Then he scooped me up and yelled that he had found me. About ten people, including people from the shop, from the hotel, and the train station gathered round. Everybody was relieved. They talked to grandma and grandpa. As my grandpa told them what I told them, they shake their heads. Grandma's eyes fogged up. Then I was told that they formed a search party to find me. I was nowhere. Nobody saw me. Nobody found me. Only when I was back from that place. I got really sick afterward. Three days of high fever and diarrhea. The doctors told my grandparents that I had food poisoning. Oddly enough about that though, we all ate the same stuff, but I was the only one getting ill. After that, we left the resort and I never got back to that place. My parents weren't told the story right away, only several, you know, months later. Which I thought was weird, but my grandparents probably had their reason. Some years ago, I talked to my grandpa about the incident. His version was that he told me that he recruited all the people around town looking for me. He tore through the whole village. My grandmother walked the length of the river, the creek, and the hotel. They looked everywhere possible for five hours. My grandma had thought people looked in every house and even stopped to train for me. I was gone until grandpa found me in that same place they saw me the last time. First they didn't want to believe me, that I was there and waited. I told them what happened and never changed my story. A day later, I got really sick, and grandpa ran with me in his arms to the doctors. I seemingly lost consciousness from high fever, which was news to me. This whole thing is bugging me. I really don't know what to make of it. The memories about it are still clear and impressive. That's why I trust the sensory perceptions of that event. Does anybody have any ideas what happened to me in that little wooded village? I work in a wildlife rehabilitation center in the middle of the forest atop a hill about 20 minutes away from the nearest streetlight. It's a beautiful property during the day, 
but at night you can hardly see your hand in front of your face unless the moon is high enough over the trees to shed a little light. For privacy's sake, I won't be giving the name or location of the facility. I started working here last year, usually being put on the closing shift from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., but we typically were on the property until the wee hours of the morning since the sheer number of animals in our care prevented us from going home before everything was complete. The facility itself is deeply haunted. I've known this since a few weeks into my employment. One of the routes for the Trail of Tears actually went through what is now the property, but more on this later. These are some of the stories I've collected while working here. One night, as we were all wrapping up downstairs and getting ready to shut down for the evening, the doorbell rang. It must have been around 10 p.m. by then, and we close admissions by 5 usually. All of our admissions are by appointment only, but on occasion, we'll get a walk-in. With a sigh, my coworker goes upstairs to greet the person and take the animal down for a quick examination. After a few minutes, she comes back down, empty-handed and looks a bit unsettled. Upon being asked what the problem was, she answered, There was no one at the door. And there's no other car in the lot. This happened at least two other times. I've always been a little sensitive to the paranormal, but I'm pretty skeptical by nature. I want to first rule out any other possible scenario before jumping to the conclusion of something otherworldly, so I chalked these events up to some sort of electrical error. The building took the whole new energy at night, though. Rooms of the facility were well lit and normal during the day, but they felt more ominous at night. I never wanted to be alone inside by myself after 8.30. After 8.30, things get weird. Mostly, it's just the feeling that I'm being watched or thinking I see something out of the corner of my eye. It's all just very unsettling. As one of our interns was leaving one night, she said she heard someone calling her from the parking lot. Psst, hey, over here. There was no one there. One night, my coworkers went outside to finish up animal care in some of the outside enclosures that hadn't been done during the day, and I was left alone inside to finish preparing diets for some of the raccoon babies we had inside. We had a microwave above the counter, and I'd long since gotten used to seeing my silhouette in the reflective sheen on the door. I reached up to retrieve the bowl I'd put in the microwave and shut the door once I was done only to see the reflection of a silhouette behind me. I whipped around so fast I nearly dropped the bowl. No one was standing behind me, and when I looked back into the reflection, the silhouette wasn't there anymore. As I said previously, the trail of tears ran through the property, and at least two of my coworkers have made separate comments about seeing a woman in buckskin, either walking through the hallway or standing in the laundry room. She always moves out of sight before anyone can try to say something to her, we have a separate little building on the property that's now a storage unit. It once housed interns that would stay on site overnight, but it's been a long time since anybody has done that. I've always gotten a weird feeling whenever I'm near it. I've never been inside, and I hope I'll never have to. Anytime I walk past it, I feel incredibly unsettled, like there's someone standing right behind me or watching me. Several months ago, I was informed we no longer have interns living in the building because of late one night, a man walked in and stood in the doorway, staring at the interns while they were trying to sleep. Since then, we've installed trail cams and security cameras all over the property. There are a million more stories I can tell you about this place, and maybe one day I will. So far, these are the only truly paranormal feeling ones that I have to tell. I'll be sure to make updates in the future if anything else happens. Thanks for listening to my ramblings. One night, I was outside trying to get my pug inside. He didn't want to come in for some reason, and was running from me with a leaf in his mouth. So I chased him, playing with him a bit. I live near the woods, and all of a sudden I heard this music. But it wasn't actually music. It's hard to explain, but the best way I can describe it is that it sounded like wind chimes. Only they definitely weren't actually wind chimes by the way they sounded and how fast it ended. It happened for maybe three seconds, and it sounded like a ton of them were going off at the same time. Then, 
it just abruptly stopped. I snatched my dog up and noped the heck out of my yard. Curious, I went inside and I googled this. I found something on Reddit from a group from 2015 who had really similar experiences with the wind chime sounds coming from the woods. Some people commented that it was fairies or something like that. It sounds like it could come from fae folklore, but I'm not sure. So, I wanted to write into the Swamp Dweller show to see if anybody in the comment section might know what this could be. I have an idea of what's going on in the woods. Just hear me out. This isn't a long story, but I have to tell someone. I live in northern Tennessee, about 30 minutes north of Nashville. One weekend in the spring of 2019, I went to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park alone. I just needed to get away for a bit. Newly single, trouble paying my new Jeep Wrangler, aka cash drain I thought I had to have. I was alone. It was a typical pleasant April day. I had gone to Klingman's Dome. I had hit some of the silly tourist shops, etc. I didn't have my camping material, so I decided to stay at a local hotel not too far away. Even though I consider myself pretty experienced in the woods, plenty of times I have wandered off the trail and camps last hiked, which I wouldn't recommend doing alone. Anyways, sorry to stray. Day two of my little trip, I get up at about 6 a.m., eat breakfast, etc. I decide to go on a day long hike. I'm close to a place called Grotto Falls which is a very pretty and scenic area. I have not seen any other hikers, nor have I seen much wildlife, which is a little odd, but I don't think much of it. I sit down and eat some energy bars. I take with my food, energy bars, water, matches, flashlight, firearm, etc. I'm setting up next to a tree enjoying the beautiful overcast day. Not the depressing kind of gray, rain, but the kind of nostalgic October gray where the clouds look like cotton candy due to the sun. Suddenly, I see movement about 30 yards ahead of me. It's tough to tell what it is as I squint and move a tad closer. I know it sounds crazy. The only way I can describe what I see is a human-shaped figure that's hard to focus on. It's a silver-colored, but transparent in a way. Almost like it was beamed but couldn't fully form or complete its beam. I couldn't move at all. I couldn't see any facial features, but I could tell and feel that I was being watched. I couldn't even muster words. I did not get any bad vibes. In fact, I got a very warming, loving vibe, or feel, in the air. As it was looking at me, I just got the vibe that I don't know lonely or maybe some sort of curious vibe about me. I don't know how to explain this. It was very beautiful. I was finally able to mutter out a half-choking, Hi! When it moved to the left, it walked up right like a human but faster than a human could ever move. It was almost digitized. Who are you? I was able to say. To my surprise and shock, I got some kind of mutter sound. It sounded like something unrecognizable. I really don't know, as it was kind of walking away and then vanished. Maybe it was all in my head, but putting it together, it almost sounded like, sorry I bothered, like English wasn't its first language. I find myself sad to see it go. I can't explain it. Most of these encounters people are terrified, but I got a very warm vibe from this. I haven't been the same since. Honestly, I would give anything to encounter it again. I find myself going back there all the time, but I have never had any experiences like that again. In fact, I'm going back there today and hoping I encounter this thing. I don't know if it was some kind of government created being or some kind of being from another dimension that couldn't show itself, or there's always the possibility I'm crazy. I know you're probably going to ask why I didn't take a picture or shoot any kind of video. Well, it's easy to say, but when you're actually in a crazy situation, it's a lot tougher to think clearly than you think. Hi, my name is Zachary, and at the time of my story I was 13 years old. 
For my birthday, my grandfather and two of my uncles took me out to a property deep in the woods around Two Harbors, Minnesota. When we got there from our six hour drive, we noticed that no hunting signs were right next to the entrance and had been bent in a way that looked like someone extremely heavy smashed the palm of their head down on the top of the side. After we unpacked our things, we made dinner and got our four wheelers out of our trailer. They will come into play a little bit later in the story. I went to look around the area of the sign Looking closer at the sign, I could see on the back of it there were four deep, long claw marks like something had crushed it like a soda can and ran a knife along the outside of it. I looked around, and I saw some massive canine footprints around the size of a softball. I started to get an uneasy feeling because I have heard of the stories and have been a true believer in the paranormal and cryptids my entire life. After I got back, we set up a bonfire out of the foliage from two 150-foot pine trees my uncles had cut down for poles. During the fire, I noticed that the forest went eerily quiet, too quiet to feel safe. Now I've grown up in the woods and have come face to face with 500-pound black bears and have not been afraid. I've had my camp that our idiot selves didn't have a fire going in surrounded by wolves and coyotes, and still I wasn't afraid. But I can tell you, I was very nervous about the next couple of hours. During the fire, the group got a whiff of this pungent odor that I can only describe as wet dog and old pee. My uncle, who we'll call Mike, literally vomited. The smell was so bad, and this had me shaking in my boots, because I've heard the stories and I know what to be aware of with my sense of smell. About 15 minutes of this god-awful smell, and it finally went away, or so I had thought. Later on that night, I decided I would go on the paved road outside of our property with one of our four-wheelers for a little while. I made the mistake of not bringing an extra clip for my Colt 1911, which I have on me at all times when I am there. When I headed out, I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched or stalked. About two miles down the road I stopped to take a leak, and that's when I realized again that the forest was once again dead silent and the smell was back. I reached for my gun that was in my back waistline, but before I could even get the gun out this giant menacing creature came slowly walking out of the woods on all fours. At about this time I was ten feet or so from the ATV which I luckily left running for the short time that I had begun. Now, this creature walked out and I was immediately in shock. I had no idea what I was looking at, but every fiber in my body knew I was looking at some sort of werewolf. Then before I could blink, I heard this gut-wrenching popping noise as the creature stood up on his hind legs. He had deeper amber eyes that were filled with pure rage and hatred. Its fur was a light black, almost gray color, that shone brightly in the light of the moon. Before this creature had time to tear me into pieces, I got my butt on the ATV and floored it out of there at 35 miles per hour. But the creature gave chase. At that moment when I saw that it was keeping up with the ATV, I felt like I was going to die at any moment. My anxiety was through the roof. It was then that I realized my gun was still partially in my waistline. I pulled it out loaded one in the chamber, while still driving at now almost 45 miles per hour. The ATV's top speed. I took the gun off the safety and fired around directly into its face. It let out a deep, low, yet strangely high-pitched scream or howl. I couldn't tell at the same time, but it felt like it shook my very soul. The creature leaped at me, but I made a sharp turn into another lane of the road. I fired two or more rounds into the creature's chest knowing damn well that I hit the thing, yet it wouldn't stop. I fired all but my last round into his chest, neck, and stomach, which slowed it down a good bit. I made my last bullet count when he was about 60 yards away from me. I stopped sharp, took aim at its eye, and fired off my last round. Apparently, I hit it dead on because it went barreling down onto the pavement and just lay there motionless without life. I slowly made my way over on the ATV, which was now almost out of gas, and to make sure it was dead I took out the machete in the back of the ATV and stabbed it clean into the beast's other eye, 
knowing that I destroyed the brain and that it would never bother anyone again. I moved the body onto the side of the road and that damn SOB was heavy. It had to be at least 400 pounds. It was almost impossible to drag into the trees. It took me nearly 20 minutes. Then I got back to camp. I parked the ATV, put the keys away, and went to sit by the campfire and smoke some weed. Because all I wanted to do was get my mind off that creature that nearly took my life. After finishing my smoke, I went into my car, grabbed an extra clip, put it in my pocket, and filled my regular clip with hollow points. After that, I went to bed in my tent with my gun under my pillow. I already had my 243 hunting rifle in the tent with me, so I felt as safe as I could be. I quickly fell asleep, and when I awoke the next morning, I smelled bacon and coffee in the air, and thought to myself that maybe all was a dream, but I checked my clip and sure enough, the hollow points were loaded in there. I walked over to where I parked the ATV the night before, and there was a deep, long, single claw mark on the back which I later got my butt chewed out for from my grandfather. I didn't tell anybody about what had happened, until I smelled it again around dusk tonight. I was going to be on my guard because if there's more than one around there, there's usually a whole pack. So I kept my rifle, my Colt, and an extra magazine for both guns with me all day, especially on the trails. Besides the smell, that day was rather uneventful. When I went to see the body at around 8 o'clock, it was gone. No blood, no body, no fur, nothing. It was just the area where I had dragged it along and dropped it the night before. I wasn't taking any chances, so I decided to stay at camp and stay awake most of the night. The next day I went out with my 22 and did some rabbit and squirrel hunting for dinner that night. Around noon I heard the same howl as when I shot the beast for the first time the night before, and there were shivers running up and down my spine. Now I still had my handgun so I knew I would be alright against one of them, but I knew if there were multiple, I would have never stepped foot on that land. The trees around me began to shake. There were branches falling everywhere around me, and that's when I saw the dog man from two nights prior. He had a soul-wrenching snarl on his face. I'm happy I had already turned the four-wheeler around because I hit the gas and didn't let off until I was back at camp. We left that night, and to this day, I do not want to return to that property ever again. I warned my grandfather and uncle, but they didn't believe me, and I, they think I just saw a bear or something. But for me, I know it wasn't a bear. The story I'm about to tell is from about a year ago. I was doing recon on a part of the woods that I had discovered the week before. I am a pretty skeptical person about the paranormal, but I don't deny its possibility. So I was advancing in the woods. I reached a spot that was unusual. It was entirely pine wood forest unlike the rest of the wood which is leafy. I thought it was strange, but still kept going further in. As I was probably a mile or so into the unknown part I had found. I heard the voice of a little girl screaming for her father. I quickly turned back to see what was going on, but I saw nothing. I continued walking for about one minute, and then I heard it again, but this time closer. I turned around and there was still nothing. I continued walking, but a bit faster this time. About two minutes later, I heard it another time, but this time it was right behind me. I checked again, but there was nothing, and then I heard a man speaking next to me, and there was still nothing. I was freaking out at this point and I grabbed my combat knife and started running as fast as I could in the opposite direction. Note that I am a pretty large dude and I don't get scared that easily, but this was just some next level stuff, man. Anyways, I managed to get back to my bike and got the heck out of there for good. If anyone has any idea about what this was, please share it in the comments and let me know. And I know my story might not be particularly scary, but thank you for sharing it anyway if you do. Hello, my name is Emma and I am 20 years old, but this happened when I was around 17 I believe. I lived in New Jersey, Browns Mills, so there were a lot of woods around. It was perfect to go camping because I love nature and it's right next to my house. So one night at around 10.30pm, I gathered my friends, Giselle, Aiden, Eli, and Louis. 
We went to the woods. We only wanted to look around because this was the New Year's, so I wanted to shoot some fireworks. But we decided to stay there for a while, so we all sat on the ground and I lit a fire so we could have s'mores. Then, Eli got up to look around. We weren't going to stay there all night until Eli found a cabin. It was a brown and greenish color. It was rusty, and it had a few stains on the windows. To give an idea of what the area looks like, there was a trail next to my house leading into a small patch of trees, and if you went past the trees you would find a small field with a cabin. So we went in. The inside was very dark, and it smelled weird like cigarette smoke. Well, that's the best way I can describe it. A huge living room with a basement. Good thing we brought sleeping bags because if not, we would have had to sleep on the floor. And it was pretty dirty, and dusty, and it smelled. I brought snacks for when I got hungry. At around maybe 12.30 a.m., Aiden, Lewis, and Eli were passed out. That meant there was only me and Giselle still awake, and I was bored. Around that time, we started hearing weird noises. Not like growling or anything, but like creepy music. So I looked out the window and I didn't see anything besides our patio, a street lamp, trees, and a white small figure. We decided to ignore it until we started hearing music again. I got annoyed, looked out and on the tree, there was what looked like a white deformed bear. I was immediately shaking. I felt like my heart was going to explode out of my chest. Bizzo asked, are you okay? I said yes, but she could tell I wasn't telling the truth. So I said I thought I saw a bear, but I'm sure it was just my imagination. Then it was silent. Her face was as pale as mine, as though she saw it herself. I asked her, did you ever see it before? She didn't say anything for a few seconds. And then she said, Yes, when I was a little kid, I used to see it all the time in the woods at night when I would play outside. I thought he was my friend, and he would walk and try to, like, talk to me all the time. A loud screech interrupted our conversation. I looked outside, at the bear outside of our cabin. We were very silent until my phone started ringing. Of course, the bear thing turned its head to see me and my friend looking out of the crack from the window. We pulled our heads in and called the cops. The bear was very tall. It was looking through the window, so we got one of our blankets immediately covered it. There's no door, so it could have easily got in. We were scared, so after that we woke up our friends and we told them to go to the basement. They didn't say anything, probably because of the look on our faces. After they went to the basement, we soon followed. Me and my friend stayed on the rotten stairs. I heard it come inside and I peeked my head out to see, and it wasn't an ordinary bear. It was tall, white, and deformed. It had red spots everywhere as well as glowing eyes. We didn't run down the stairs because it would make too much noise. Instead, we quietly tiptoed down the stairs. My friend said their ears were ringing. I told them to be quiet. I checked my phone and it was around 3 a.m., so we decided to try to go to bed, but I wound up staying awake just to make sure it didn't come down here with us. Later, at around 6 a.m., the sun was coming up. I checked upstairs and found some of our things were not there, and some of them were scattered around the room. The bear was missing. I'm so glad I survived that. I'm never going camping again, though. Thank you for sharing my story. My family and I go camping every year in Money Creek, past Index in Washington. This happened two years ago. It's still something that bothers me deeply, as I was only 16 at the time. Here's some background though. It was windy and cold. I believe fall was right around the corner because we were late for camping. I only remember this because the air was crisp. I woke up at around 3 in the morning. I looked at my phone and after I adjusted to being blinded, 
I saw it was only a few minutes past. The family was asleep, so I thought it was perfect time to smoke a cigarette. We were up in a multifamily site, so being across from the bathrooms gave me a good excuse to leave. I grabbed my last smoke and took off after bundling up, hooking a right and following the road to the other side of the grounds. As I started smoking, I started to feel sick, dreadful even. Coming up on the other side of the bathrooms, I stopped and looked around. As I felt something was wrong, I could just feel it in the air. I peered over my shoulder, looking deep into the pitch black green belt. There was a silhouette of a man. I, I think. It was darker than the blackness around it, and I froze. I looked about an inch up where a face should have been. All I saw were two white dots, and they were staring into me. I went to step back but heard a whisper behind me. It was so close it seemed like it was everywhere, but I had a feeling I needed to run. So, that's exactly what I did. I turned heel so fast I almost tripped and dropped my cigarette. The thing was only half done. I was sprinting so hard I was choking on the cold air and got tunnel vision. What seemed like an eternity later, which couldn't have been more than five minutes, I was back at the campsite. I practically dived into my tent and curled up in a ball in my bag. I didn't even tell my mom about it, until about a month ago that is. There's a man in the woods, and I'm worried he's after me. So it's the summer of 2013. I'm 21, and I just finished my junior year in college. The second week of August, a group of my friends and I go on an eight-day camping trip. It's seven of us in total. Four guys and three girls. We're camping in a semi-remote campground in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It was a large campground, but very few other campers were there. There were a few field sites near the front of the campground, but we purposefully requested a campground in the back corner. We were completely by ourselves. During the trip, we planned a whitewater rafting trip for one of the days. We were hiking Mount Washington towards the end of the trip and thought maybe we'd do another one to two other small hikes, with one to two days of just chilling by the lake at the campground. We also planned on doing plenty of drinking during the evenings. The first couple of days of the trip are fantastic. Whitewater rafting was a blast. Everything's going great. So it's the evening of our third day we have a roaring fire going. We're all just hanging out at the campsite drinking and just messing around. It's around 9.30 when a disheveled looking man walks past our site. His clothes are kind of torn or worn out, messy and tangled hair, etc. He looks to be maybe in his mid-40s. This isn't weird though. We all just think it's another camper doing a late evening stroll around the campground. About an hour and a half later we see this same man walk past our site in the same direction. This time he's walking slower almost with a bit of a limp. We're all pretty drunk at this point. I think one of us might have yelled something out to him, but he just kind of ignores us and keeps on walking. Mildly strange, but still is probably just someone who wanted to take a long walk. We wrapped up the night at around 1.30 or 2, I believe. The fire is dying down and we head back to our tents. I usually love sleeping while camping, I usually find it extremely peaceful, but for some reason, I was having trouble sleeping this night. I get up to go take a pee in the woods. When I do, I see a faint light maybe about 50 to 75 yards ahead of me in the woods if I remember correctly. It looks like a dim flashlight or something similar. I decided, for whatever reason, I want to go investigate. I go back to the tent. One of my other buddies is still awake, so I tell him about it. We get up to investigate. When we do, the light is no longer on. Feeling just a little bit unnerved, I shine my flashlight around the woods a bit, but don't see anything, so I decide maybe my eyes were just playing tricks on me before I go and head back to bed. Sometime later that night, I wake up to a terrifying scream. It was Sarah, 
one of the girls we were camping with. I jumped out of my tent as quickly as possible and nearly run into her as she's running back into our sight. She's still screaming. She screamed that there's a man standing in the middle of the woods. Now, our whole party is awake and freaking the heck out. I try to calm Sarah down enough to get her to explain what actually happened. She says she went to go pee in the woods and saw the man from earlier just standing about 15 feet away from her, not moving, being like a statue. We all start freaking out, yelling and screaming and making a giant commotion. I'm internally freaking out and trying to calm down though. I'm just trying to be the voice of reason. If I can get everyone to calm down enough, we can maybe do something. We obviously decide to get the heck out of there. We frantically take down our tents, basically just ripping the poles down and throwing everything into the back of our cars. Then we sped out of there. It's around 4am, we're in two separate cars and decide just to drive away from the campsite and try to clear our heads. Eventually at around 5.30, we find a small diner that's open and decide to head in for some breakfast. We all have different theories about what the heck just happened. Some of us think we just ran into a homeless guy who was camping out in the woods and was surprised by us. Some of the girls think maybe he was purposely stalking us. Either way, obviously none of us are comfortable staying at that campground again. I head back to the front desk of the campground with two of the other guys. We explain what happened and the guys at the front desk actually seem to believe us but said there were definitely no other campers currently that fit the description of that guy. They were insanely nice about it though, and actually refunded most of the remainder of our stay, which astonished me. As a group, we decided to say F it, and we weren't letting one freaky guy ruin our trip. We found another campground, and it ended up being fine. For the most part. At least, we thought it was. Fast forward two days. We're hiking Mount Washington. We get up really early and get to the mountain at around 7.30 a.m. to start hiking up. We're a little over halfway up the mountain when we see the very same guy hiking down. Though this time he looks much better. His hair isn't crazy. His hiking clothes are relatively clean. We are all just frozen. A few of us let out a surprise scream. He just strolls past us with a massive grin. Luckily, there are enough hikers nearby that nothing could really happen. We decide to continue hiking up anyways since he is headed in the opposite direction and hope we never encounter him again. We did finish the hike and luckily we didn't see him again. After that, we did decide to cut a trip a little short because, honestly looking back on it, we've all come to the conclusion that we were likely being stalked in some way. If it was just some homeless guy in the woods near the campground, what the heck was he doing hiking down Mount Washington a couple of days later? It was a pretty unnerving and bizarre experience for sure. i love to hear anybody's thoughts or comments down below. First of all, let's preface by saying this was in the early 90s. And as we all know, it was a very different world those days. And I was a pretty naive kid. Also... I had kind of a messed up childhood, so this was not the worst thing to happen by far, and therefore I pretty much brushed it off. When I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, I would visit the Boy Scouts Club a lot, which was pretty big back then, and my parents thought that sending me to Boys Club camp for the summer only made sense. The camp was not an overnight type deal, but featured all of the normal things you'd expect like lakes, arts, and stuff like that. I did the normal camp stuff like found a girlfriend and getting into a whole lot of trouble. The camp was run by counselors which I can only assume were in their 20s to 30s. When you're 12, everyone seems old. And as you would expect, they would come up with very interesting punishments for kids. Like being forced to carry a huge wooden totem pole in circles in a hot field for some time. I never actually had this punishment but I remember one of the other kids getting it or just straight up punching you in your chest and knocking the wind out of you, which I did experience. One of the counselors that I had this experience with was named TJ, and he was a very large, well-built guy in his 20s. One day I did something wrong and got sent to the lunch area for essential detention. The area was actually a large concrete floor with a wooden roof attached to a cabin that contained the kitchen. 
It was basically a school lunch setup where you would come and choose chocolate milk or orange juice and get served a crappy turkey sandwich, a pack of mayo, and one of those amazing brownies. When I get there, I notice there are about four or five kids already sitting at benches, and TJ is in front of everyone by the lunch area, pacing and saying something. I sit down and don't really remember what happened until things started to get weird. TJ pulled out a knife and got an apple. He started skinning and stabbing it, and saying stuff like, this is what I'll do to you if you get in trouble again, and other things of that nature. At this time, I honestly did not feel scared in any way, due to my tendency to completely shut down when stuff got bad, but I did remember feeling very creeped out and that he was trying very hard to be threatening. The younger kids especially, a little girl who was maybe eight or so, was freaking out crying. The next thing I remember is him telling her to follow him into the kitchen. I then heard lots of screaming and crying coming from the back of the kitchen. After a while, he came back with her, and her face was streamed with tears. I remember it vividly. He then looked at me and another boy and told us to follow him. And he escorted us to a huge walk-in refrigerator and brought us inside and said, I want you to both start screaming and acting like I'm killing you in here. If you don't make the other kids scared, I'll kill you for real. We did as he asked. And when he closed the door, we started screaming and wailing. At this point, I honestly thought it was some kind of joke or something because I rationalized that the little girl was told the same thing. Anyways, after maybe 5 or 10 minutes, he let us out and told us to go back to our benches. Again, I don't remember anything after this, just kind of feeling blank. I remember when I got home that night from camp telling my mom about it, and I remember she called somebody and I think that guy got fired. I don't remember ever seeing him again, and my parents never sent me back. I never really thought about it much growing up, but as the years have gone by, I look back on things that I've shrugged off as normal, and I see they were anything but that. If you spend enough nights camping, weird things will happen. A couple of years ago, two buddies and I did a month-long camping trip across the United States. We would camp in the U.S. Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management areas, and we were driving my pickup truck so we could get back in some fairly deep wilderness on forest roads. After about 15 nights on the road, we ended up in some BLM land near Black Canyon, of the Gunnison National Park in Colorado. It was our last night in Colorado, and we were exhausted from doing a 14-mile hike earlier that morning. We found the coordinates of a campsite online and arrived at the edge of the pavement at about 6 p.m. Ahead of us was a dusty two-track lane that snaked through scraggy trees and brush. It made its way to a top of a hill and had views of snow-capped peaks. We hadn't passed a car in a long time. Our truck makes it to the site easily, but none of us get out yet. We sit around inside and look. There is a fire pit, lots of trees, but also an abandoned couch and some other signs of human waste. Not great vibes. It's getting late and we aren't keen on the idea of driving more. We hop out and start walking around, cautiously approaching some garbage bags wrapped in duct tape. This seems like a place where you would find a body, I say to my friends and they agree. We notice a trail that seems to go in a circle around the top of the hill. We decide to go check that out before we commit to staying. We find some more trash and human waste, but nothing that makes us feel like we should leave. We decide to cowboy camp, sleep on a tarp beneath the stars, and have a nice fire going. We finish off a case of beer, but even with the inebriation, we still feel uneasy. Every couple of minutes, one of us will shine a light into the woods, thinking that we heard something. Even though this is our 20th consecutive night sleeping outside, it doesn't feel right. But it's late, so we start getting ready for bed. We were all carrying bear spray and headlamps. I step into the woods to go pee and walk about 15 feet without turning on my light. I'm standing there peeing. I decide to turn on my light, since the fire messed up my night vision. When I see what the beam of light illuminates, my knees nearly buckle. My jaw is dropped. I stand in silence for 10 seconds before calling out to my friends. G -g -g guys did you see this? 
In the center of my beam is a bunch of bleached bones wrapped in barbed wire. Hanging from a branch directly above the trail we had walked in, we would have certainly noticed them in the daylight. They must have been hung once it got dark. While we sat only 25 feet away, the consensus among us was screw that, so we snapped a couple of photos of it before throwing our stuff in the car and getting the hell out of there. We drove a little way up the road to a national park campground. I never felt so happy to pay $25 and have neighbors nearby. Whoever put those up during that night, honestly, let's never meet. My hypothesis is that a rancher with a grazing lease put the bones up to scare off the scum that leaves all their trash at the campsites. They're probably cow bones, but they still scared the hell out of me though. As I'm writing this, I'm still not sure what I truly saw, but I believe it was a skimwalker or something like that. For clarification, I live in North Australia. I hope this helps. I was invited to go on a short camping trip with a friend of mine who I'll call Alan. I met up with him at his house early around 9am, and we talked and watched some TV for a few hours before heading out. The place we were heading to was a deep forest high up in the mountains. I didn't know the area well since I had just moved there so I was not sure what the place was called. The trip there was quite pleasant as I and Alan talked and enjoyed each other's company. It was nice to catch up with a friend. Once we arrived we parked the car and started unpacking our equipment. We started setting up our tent and getting ready to start a fire to cook our food. At around 11 p.m. Alan said he was probably going to head to bed as he got up early that morning and was getting tired. I wanted to stay up a little bit longer and just take in the fresh air in view of the forest. After about 10 minutes, I had to go to the bathroom, so I decided to go out into the woods and do my business. I didn't wander too far, but far enough that I wouldn't attract any animals or lose sight of the camp. Once I was done, I started to head back to the camp, and then I saw it. It was a very skinny looking dog like creature, standing in the middle of the campsite. The thing was unnaturally skinny, and its limbs seemed contorted like it had gotten hit by a car. However, the creature walked as if it was natural. It walked on four limbs and was very graceful with its movements. It was extremely slow and lanky. I didn't know what to do other than stand there at the tree line and watch it. The creature then started to head towards Alan's tent. I was feeling uneasy and not sure if the creature was dangerous or not. The thing sniffed at the entrance of Alan's tent and started to scratch softly as it wanted to get in. Then, with one swift motion, the creature stood up on two legs. It must have been at least eight feet tall. Then it just ran into the opposite direction of where I was standing into the woods. I waited for another five minutes before deciding to come out of hiding and go back to my tent. As I got in and tucked myself into my sleeping bag, I heard a loud screech that sounded like a combination of a man and a pig. It sent chills down my spine. I barely got any sleep that night. In the morning, Alan could tell that I was bothered by something and asked me, Hey, are you okay? I asked him if he heard anything at night near his tent and he told me that he had slept through the whole night pretty, pretty soundly. He, of course, was curious now and started to ask me if something was outside of our tent. I knew he wouldn't believe me, so I just said there was a stray dog snooping around the camp. I still don't know what I saw, but I know for sure it wasn't some stray dog. If someone could please tell me what I saw or at least give me an idea of what it was, I would really, really appreciate it. And thank you, Swamp, for sharing my story. I was probably 19 at the time, and this was about 20 years ago. I was in the woods of Northern California in the Sierras. It was a small town called White Pines where my grandparents' house is, and surrounding the neighborhood is a bunch of woods. I was driving my Dodge Ram Charger up past a lake that used to be used for logging, and then it was turned into the lake. 
The road goes past a lake into a baseball field into thicker woods. I was in search of a party because many teenagers would go out into the woods and drink as well as party. You could pretty much crash any party because nobody really cared about if somebody who wasn't invited showed up because we all pretty much knew each other. So I was driving up on the main logging road and decided to turn up on a smaller road to see if I saw fire lights or anything. I started driving slowly and decided to stop to check if I heard anything. I was sitting on my lights, just chilling and waiting for anything as far as noise or sight of a party. All of a sudden a creature came across a small road out of the woods. I didn't see clothes but what appeared to be hair, and it had to be at least six to maybe be eight feet or more. I saw the lower body but I couldn't see the face. It appeared to be almost white, but it may have just been the headlights. It seemed to move slowly across and then disappeared. I was frightened and not sure if it was a Bigfoot or what. I took off down the road and was going to hang out and camp because I hadn't camped in a while and figured if I couldn't find the party, at least I'd camp. So I set up a tent and was off the road a bit and was just relaxing when I began to hear what sounded somewhat like howling. Like somewhat of a coyote, but then kind of like a wolf. It freaked me out somewhat because it wasn't a regular howling because I know coyote howls and these were definitely not them. The sound started to get closer and closer. It was almost so loud that the trees were almost booming. I felt every emotion from being very scared to creeped out to pissed off. I, I was just so creeped out I threw everything in my truck and drove off. I did end up finding a party later and got drunk and ended up in my truck passed out. Thanks for sharing, Swamp. I have some other shadow people stories and ghost or demon stories that I might share in the future.